nice to see everyone's nice smiling faces this morning. And uh, we'd like to start out with a few announcements, and then we're going to have Amy light the candles for us. The uh, first announcement is actually a letter from the Garms. Uh, I'm going to read part of the letter, and then they put a special bottom, special at the bottom for us. Yeah, this is going to go really good. Dear friends, wasn't the open house for the Gospel Gym a wonderful time? Our family thought so. Thank you for being a part of the event taking the time to travel and enjoying all the Lord is doing in this place. Each member of the Garms family wishes to say thank you for all the kind and generous gifts to the ministry. Your donations, along with the others from the event, totaled $12,441, which permits us to move ahead with purchasing the products needed to paint the exterior of the building, plus some. To God be the glory, and thank you very much. And at the bottom, they said, Dear family from Glenvale, thank you. We would, we would have loved to have had each one of you out here for the open house, but we appreciate your prayers and know that you have been the ones that have prayed this into existence. So thank you very much. And the pail is still out there if you would like to continue to contribute because they're going to have expenses while they get the school up and running. So... Okay, it's not Amy. It is Miss Barb who has graced us this morning with her presence. Would you like to go ahead and come up? And this is to represent the light of light of Jesus entering the building, which we know he was here before us. But this reminds us that he is with us the entire time. Okay, and just in case y'all don't like to pay attention during the announcements, I fall asleep during them personally, but there is a calendar, so if you miss what I say, it's all on the calendar. This is the one for August, so that is available right outside the sanctuary then. Oh, I got a mess here. Uh, yes, tomorrow, anyone that has anything to do with any of the commissions at the church, the council, the, um, I want to say children and youth, it's Christian Ed, Worship and Outreach, that's what I was thinking of. Um, there is a combined meeting tomorrow at 7 o'clock here at the church. Um, there will also, we're going to try for the third week in a row now for a Wednesday meeting. Following prayer, we're going to have a special congregational meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So barring any illnesses, road construction, we will have the meeting this Wednesday. Today is the special Sunday for camp offering. Obviously, you can donate for camp anytime you want to, but we bring attention to it this Sunday. There is a box out inside the vestibule area. And we are also, we are not working the cake stand at the carnival this year, but we are trying to help Mary Ellen um, get the stuff she needs for the cake stand. So anyone that wants to bake or knows how to go to Giant and buy something, um, I'm very good at that. Walmart, Walmart yeah, preferably cheaper. <laughs> Grocery outlet, Costco's. The list is endless. Um, her phone number, we have her phone number here. I'm not going to announce it. Just anyone that wants to help, she prefers texting. That way she can keep track of everything. So anyone that's watching on the internet, also you can call into the church here and request that phone number. Uh, next Sunday we will be at the park. I'll be preaching there. And then we'll also have the 8 and the 10.30 here. Uh, the carnival does run the previous Monday through Saturday. Not sure how it's going to be for parking as far as getting down like we normally do. Um, but I know like last month we were able to shoot down on either side and I don't know where the where the rides will be so if right but I mean I know they tear down pretty quickly after the last night so I don't know just um, if you're planning on coming to the park just plan on bringing a chair just in case you can't drive down to the the bandstand but feel free to join us there because you can also 
make it in time for the 1030 here then also. More. More, 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 more. Uh, do do do, and then next Sunday evening. Stop that! I'm not heard you laughing. Next Sunday evening at five o'clock, Dusty Alleman, who a lot of people are probably familiar with, he performs here. Um, on his way home from here last time, on his way around, he lost his engine to the motor coach. Be about ten thousand dollars. Now he does have some insurance to help out, but they also we're also having a Benefit, thank you. Benefit concert here, and Joe Tomlinson, Randy Simpson, and Randy Penzinger will be performing here to help raise money to get him the new engine. And Dusty will also be performing a song as well. So that's next Sunday at 5 o'clock. And don't forget the online church directory and you can pick up the cards as to how to access it they're in a flower pot and out in the vestibule area nice thing is once you access it you can put it on the front screen of your uh, smartphone so you don't have to go on the internet anymore to get it and anyone interested in ten dollar uh, discount cards for local venues and restaurants pastor larry has them and they benefit the youth sports for east pensboro I may need if I can't get into his phone. Ah, see, I'll need to. Can you let Pastor know I'll need him to unlock his phone again then? Can you get Pastor, let him know I need him to unlock his phone? I don't have his face. So today's good word from God's word from Phil Enlow. Falsely accused. Have you ever been accused of doing something you didn't do? It happens quite often, and it certainly puts a person on the defensive. When you're assumed guilty before proven innocent. It's Pastor Phil with a good word from God's word today. Have you ever heard this statement of accusation? Look what you made me do. Well, I call it the 20-foot rule. You know, if you're within 20 feet of a person that drops something or messes up in some way, you'll get the blame for it. For us to allow, for us to always blame someone else is part of our human nature, and Jesus addressed blame in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. He said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, or falsely say all kinds of evil things against you, because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you so today if you're wrongfully accused you're in good company and you've got a reward coming it's pastor Phil saying look what you made me read in this good word from God's word today be blessed and I need your face And with that, we're going to go to prayer. Oh, wait, did you send that to me? Oh, okay, so I didn't need your phone. Well, Heavenly Father, we come to you very humbled right now with the opportunity to gather in your house, to gather with our family, to worship you, to come to you in prayer, and to just spend time with each other. We come to you right now with a prayer from Melissa Nagengast. Her friend Chris needs urgent prayer for a miracle healing from cancer. He is now on hospice, and we know that historically hospice is an end result of a disease, but it does not have to be, Heavenly Father. We know that you are the one that tells us when our time's up. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that through this, we pray that you will receive glory, honor, and praise, regardless of how it ends up. We just pray that your will be done, and we pray for peace and comfort for all involved to know that your will will be done. And Heavenly Father, we pray also for John Fine, 
who did something to his ankle and he can't put weight on it, Lord God. He just just got over his cough and, you know, finally was able to come back to church. And now he's he's down again, Lord God. And we just bring to him to you for healing. Just pray that you will heal his ankle and just keep our brother safe, Lord God, and keep him healthy and bring him back to us again. He's also asking for prayer. Oh, no, we're giving praise for John Fine's daughter, who is actually doing well and back to work after COVID. And Heavenly Father, there seems to be a run of it going on. We got Richard and Mary Joyce. Mary is doing better, and Richard is struggling through the COVID, but he's finally getting better. We also have Katie Dusky, who tested positive for COVID. And they have Ashley on meds to keep her from getting it. We have Crystal Smith, who tested positive for COVID, Lord God, and, but yet Pastor Mark tested negative, and we, we give you praise for that, Lord God. For Pastor Stacy Goodling, Sue, and Joseph, who have tested positive for COVID after their week at scout camp, and for Brenda Feebig, who is still suffering from COVID. Heavenly Father, we know it's real. There's no question that it's real, but we just pray for healing, Lord God, and we pray for strength for all that have it. And we pray for the strength of those who don't have it, Lord God, to understand that you're in control and you don't give it to us, but you allow, it to, allow us to get it sometimes for whatever reason to strengthen us. But we know that you will heal, Lord God. You are the ultimate healer, and we thank you and praise you for that. We pray for Star Rice for killed kidney failure, Lord God. We just pray that you will just touch her, he, touch her kidneys and heal them, Lord God, that she will not need dialysis. Just pray that you will just help the kidneys to start working properly again, Lord God. We pray for Joseph Stapira, his daughter. We just saw on Facebook this morning, he's asking for prayers for his daughter, who was transported to Hershey this morning, early in the morning, for heart issues, Lord God. We don't know exactly what heart issues they are, but Heavenly Father, we don't need to know that. You know all that's involved, and you know who all's involved, and we just pray for peace and comfort for all involved and for healing for his daughter, Joy, Lord God. Uh, Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for Jerry Hoop right now, who is having the 90th birthday on Monday, Heavenly Father, and we just we're asking for people to send out cards, give them a card shower, and just show them how much we love and appreciate them, Lord God. And like I said, that's on Monday. He turns 90. I'm not even sure I want to live that long, but if you have stuff for me to do, then so be it. Praying for the rapture before that, but we'll see. And Heavenly Father, Antonio has two prayer requests, and one is for his sister's ex who's trying to force her to do things his way. And we know that in a separation, it always, it, it tends to get ugly, Lord God. And we just pray for resolution. We pray for peace. And we pray that they will be able to just do things together. Not together, together, but to agree on what they're doing. And we also pray for Antonio's brother to find a consistent, decent job. And Heavenly Father, we pray that he will get the job that you want him to have. And we pray that this will work for your glory, Lord God, and your glory only. For Juan Thomas, Pastor Pastor Larry and Lou's neighbor, who fell off his tractor and tore his rotator cuff, as well as for Luella, who has a minor tear in her rotator cuff. Heavenly Father, we know this is painful. We know it's not something enjoyable. We've seen others in the church with it, and we've seen the healing. We pray for the same, Lord God. We pray for your healing touch to just touch both of them and to mend the rotator cuffs to alleviate the pain and allow them to get back to life as normal whatever normal is, but Heavenly Father, we continue to pray healing for Sophie. We've seen it before. I haven't personally seen it, but I've heard the wonderful things. 25 years ago, she was given six months to live. She's still here smiling, bouncing around, jumping, hugging people. And Heavenly Father, this is a witness to your love, to your glory, and to Sophie's humbleness to you and heavenly father we pray that you will just heal your servant lord god heal sophie take the cancer from her again the doctor said that they will give her as long as they can that's that's a crock lord god you're the only one that can give her time 
And we're coming to you for that time, Lord God. We're asking you to heal her again and just keep her with us to finish the work that you have given to her. But Heavenly Father, most of all, we pray that your will be done and you be glorified through all that transpires. We pray for Charlie Summer, Lord God. We pray that he will see your presence in every aspect of his life as well as in the lives of those people around him, Lord God. Sometimes it's harder to see our own lives than it is somebody else's. We just pray that you will surround him with people that he can see you shining through them and allow that to radiate into his life that he can see you as well. We pray for Pastor Brian Rosenbaum, who is in the hospital after another fall, or after a fall, um, dislocated knee, sprained ankle, two other things I can't bring to mind right now. Uh, I thank you that I got to meet with him the other day before work, and he, Lord, he's just a powerful man, powerful witness, very happy, and he's been in the hospital in and out for six months. And Heavenly Father, I've heard his story, I've heard what you're using him to do, and I just pray that you will heal him and get him out of the hospital and send him back home to finish the work that you have given to him, and I thank you once again for the opportunity to meet with him. And Heavenly Father, there's just so many prayer requests. We pray safe travel for Jeff Fraser and family as they're coming back from Pittsburgh. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will guide them home safely, get them home safely. And we pray for safety and for peace and comfort for Antonio on Tuesday, Lord God, as he goes for his driver's license. And we know that giving him the mobility will give him more opportunity to serve you, Lord God. And we pray that you will make this possible and just give him safety and comfort when he goes for his test, Lord God. And, and Heavenly Father, we just lift the rest of these up to you. There's just so many. And Heavenly Father, we don't want to neglect any of them, but you know what they all are. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that your will be done in every single one of these. And we pray that you we pray for healing, for peace and comfort, for guidance, for salvation. But above all, we pray that you be glorified through every single answer you give, Lord God. And Heavenly Father, we pray now that you will have your way with this service. Pray that you will just draw everyone near, just quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and just lift our souls up. Lift our hearts and our souls up, Lord God, that we may worship you in all its glory. Praise and thank you for this day and for your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Stand with us as we open our worship with Standing on the Promises. Standing on the Promises, I cry.
and stand on your promises. Amen. That you're the God who never changes. Mm -hmm. You're the God who never fails. Amen. Lord, life changes around us, mm -hmm. but you never change. <laughs> so just, you know, open our eyes, guide our steps, draw our hearts close to you yes, today, and let us just stand, stand, stand on those promises. We pray that you would bless this time of worship. Let our worship be pleasing to you. And let us know it is good to be in your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <coughs> amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Yeah, and all the time. That's why it's good. good. We are so <laughs> conditioned. You know, it's kind of like my cat, right? I just, I learned so much about God from my cat. Right? But, but, uh, but honestly, no, think about this. If you've ever had a cat, you know, they just, I, I've said this before, you know, Oreo is our cat's name and he just, you know, he dwells in our house. Right. And, and I mean, he's just there. Right. And, and I think to myself, wow, you know, we are to dwell in the house of the Lord, aren't we? I mean, you look at the way a cat does it. He just plops down. And I am here. You know? <laughs> God would so wants us doing that, right? But he's conditioned, too. I mean, he knows when we get up. And he watches us walk down the steps. And it's time for a treat. It's time for this. And I'll tell you what, my dear Christian friends, this morning, if we are not conditioned to when God's moving, then we're not really dwelling, right? I mean, we got to just dwell in his house. He is so good. To us. Well, anyway, I didn't practice that before I said it, but it seemed to make sense. Anyway, we give to him because he has given to us. That's right. There's a box in the back there, right as you walk in the door, and you can put tithes and offerings there. You can also go to glenvalecog.com and click on the button and give electronically as well. So let's sing the doxology together. And I just pray the gifts and the giver would be blessed. And that is those gifts go forth, that your kingdom would come right here on this earth, just like it is in heaven. So we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we all can be seated as Pastor Carolyn. I just love when you sing for us. And, um, and she's going to sing for us this morning. I asked her what key this song was in, and she said, um, she looked at the, the lyric sheet, and she said, I don't know. What did I say? You said you don't know. Oh, that's probably true. That's probably true. <laughs> yeah, I, um, if, I, if I can sing this morning, I ate a half a lemon before I got here, and that works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How do you sing after that? But anyway, we're going to attempt to sing Sweet Beulah Land. We may have to repeat this at another time. Who knows? Time on. 
Thanks so much, Caroline. What a beautiful, beautiful song. Would you stand, you know, as you do, um, I don't know, do you, do you have your Bibles handy there? I'd really like you to look up the 23rd chapter of Psalm. You know, it's a familiar, familiar song. But just let your spirit dwell on this this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. For his name's sake. I love the next part. He restores my soul. Has your soul been restored this morning? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, For, Lord, you are with me, the God who created the world, the Lord of the universe. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the midst, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and his presence is here this morning if you're in Christ today then you're a new creation and he's in the business of restoring your soul worship together so as we sing my chains are gone amazing grace my chains are gone
praise the Lord this morning. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. So Thank you, Jesus. The joy we share when we tarry with our Lord, when we abide in his presence, when we are continually seeking his face and seeking his will in our lives, he blesses us beyond measure, especially and of course even in our trials. We have such an amazing God who loves us beyond measure. We are so blessed. Yes, we are. All right. Well, I'm, oh, there we go. Well, I want to remind you that for your safety, our campus is protected with a system that scrubs 99.99% of the SARS-2 virus from the, the air and on the surfaces in this building. Now, we had a little bit of a problem during vacation Bible school because we didn't realize that the unit downstairs would be hindered by the partitions we put up. And so we did have some cases of COVID, but uh, we're working around that for the next vacation Bible school. And we are blessed that even those who did get the COVID are doing better. And we give God the glory for that. Also, if you are willing to or want to give online, for those of you that are watching this, you can just scan the code or you can go to 
gvcog.com or glenvalecog.com and click there and give. Again, we're not about money here. If you feel led to do that, then so be it. There is also a video archive for those of you that are watching and may have missed some of the services. You can go back, or if you're even here today and you missed a service and you want to go back and check it out, you can do that just by going to the gvcog.com or glenvalecog.com and uh, checking it out. I'm going to begin with a story this morning. I heard about a man, a very rich man, who made his fortune in crocodile farming. He would take the skins of the crocodiles and he would sell them to the top fashion houses in the world. One day he threw a party at his farm and in the middle of the party he posed a challenge to the audience. He said, if any one of you young fellows can swim across this crocodile pool from one end to the other, I'll reward you with the hand of my beautiful daughter. Obviously that created quite a stir as the people were wondering who was going to take the challenge. It was a major buzz of conversation because not only was this man's daughter extremely beautiful, but she was also the daughter of a very wealthy man. And all of a sudden, there was a splash. And they looked, and here was a young man crossing through that pool, sometimes fending off the crocodiles, wrestling with them. And a few seconds later, miraculously, he climbed out the other end of the pool. And as he was drying himself off, the rich man came to him and said, You know, I'm going to congratulate you. You have won the hand of my beautiful daughter. But I want to know one thing. What was on your mind when you jumped into the pool? The young man said, it's not what happened or what I was thinking of before I jumped into the pool. I want to know who pushed me. <laughs> Maybe some of us can relate to this story. When something presented before us seems like an impossible task or an impossibility, sometimes we need someone to push us into the unknown. Before we can come to the realization that we have hidden talents or undiscovered gifts in our lives, do we need to be forced to accomplish what we didn't think we could do? Yeah, some of us do. I'm going to look at scriptures today of biblical characters who overcame their perceived own inabilities for the glory of God. We'll begin by picking up on a conversation between Moses and God. This occurred at the burning bush. God had just told Moses that he wanted him to go to Pharaoh so that, the Egypt, so that the Israelites could be free from the tyranny of Egypt and go back to their homeland. Stand with me, if you would, while we read from the Word of God. <clears throat> We're beginning in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would just open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we would hear your message to us this morning that we would understand that much of what we think of ourselves is not true. Many of us think of ourselves as unworthy, but every one of us has been worthy of the death of Jesus only because of the death of Jesus. Every one of us has gifts and talents that were given to us to serve you. And so, Father, as we look at these three men that we will look at today, may we be encouraged to be open to you. Have your way now, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Moses answered God, and he said, what if they don't believe me? Or what if they don't listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? A staff, he replied. 
the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. I think I might have done that too. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Once again, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless the reading of your word. And Father, that your word will be received with joy. Not only be received, Father, but that we would dwell upon that word. That we would be doers of your word. And that we would teach others your word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, I love sinus drainage. It's so wonderful. Throughout Scripture, God asks some questions. In the Garden of Eden, he asked Adam and Eve, Where are you? Who told you you were naked? He asked Sarah before Isaac was born, Why are you laughing? He asked Jacob, What is your name? And of course, in the Scripture we just read, he asked Moses, what is in your hand? Of course, God knew, and he knows the answer to the questions before he asks the questions. But he asks them so that we begin to think, we begin to ponder on those questions, and perhaps come to the right conclusion. The title of our message this morning is, What? What's in your hand? For some of you that got my email this week, I posed that question to you ahead of time so you could be thinking about it, and you're probably going, well, there wasn't anything in my hand. You'll get the picture later. <laughs> this question, what is in your hand, is probably one of the most important questions that God will ever ask us. And this morning, I want to offer three examples of ordinary men who did extraordinary things that came out of the most unlikely circumstances and it was because of what was in their hands. To Moses, to Samson, to David, he all he implied that question. Each of these men had doubts. They had inadequacies. Nobody's perfect, right? They had excuses why they couldn't do what God had called them to do. How many of you, at one time or another, felt God urging you to do something and your immediate thought was, I can't do that. I'm not worthy. I don't know enough. I can't speak very well. Whatever your excuse may have been. I think most of us have encountered that in our lives. Maybe you've heard an urgent call for Sunday school teachers or nursery workers. Maybe you're called to read scripture. Maybe God wants you to witness to somebody. Oh, I can't do that. Well, we're going to talk about Moses here in a minute, and maybe you'll change your mind. So whether you're called to lead a Bible study or Sunday school class or just witness to anyone, we need to remember that what we look at in ourselves is perceived by ourselves, not necessarily the truth. So that's when God says to us, what's in your hand? Beginning with Moses, Scripture gives many details about Moses. It talks about his birth. It talks about his life in the palace. It talks about his life afterward. It talks about his calling, his leadership, his challenges, his failures, his victories, and his miracles. One of the things that I love about the Word of God is it doesn't mince words. It doesn't hide anything. It presents humanity as humanity is in its fallen state and our need for the Lord. One of the most written about people in Scripture is Moses. 
he has not only talked about a lot, he authored the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Yet, before he really obeyed God, he had to have that confrontation with God in, well, before the burning bush. And it wasn't until he had that confrontation and determined in his heart that he was going to obey the Lord that God was really able to use him to his glory. We pick it up at Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where God said to Moses, The cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So, Moses, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses' response was, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Isn't that just like us? Who am I to do that? You got the wrong guy. And Moses said, Lord, I can't do that. I can't do what you want me to do. He had this excuse and that excuse. He said, people won't accept me. I'm not a good order. I can't even, I can hardly speak. I can get that one. That happens to me often. I lose it a lot. And he said, let somebody else do it. That's when God asked that simple question. What is in your hand? What's in your hand? You may be sitting there right now and saying, there's nothing in my hand. But hopefully by the end of this, you'll get the point. When God said to Moses, what's in your hand? Moses said, my staff. For 40 years, he had been a shepherd. He was now 80 years old. He was preparing to retire. And God said, no. Nope, you're too young at 80 years old. Bear that in mind. Moses looked at his hand. He said a staff. He had always carried that staff for most of his life. God said, throw it on the ground. So Moses did it. And suddenly it became a snake. And it scared the snot out of him. And then God said, pick it up by the tail. And about that time, I don't know about you, but I'd have been run in the opposite direction. But he was obedient to the Lord. And that's important to get a hold of. We must be obedient to our Heavenly Father. That would be a really great place for an amen. amen. So you do agree. Amen. Are you sure you agree that we should be obedient? Scripture says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Thankfully, Moses was obedient. The staff the snake turned back into the staff, and over the next 40 years of Moses' life, God used that simple wooden stick that he had always had to deliver the Israelites from Pharaoh. Who would have thought that God could use what Moses already had? Think about that one for a second. Who would have thought that God could use what Moses already had? How many of you know that nothing is impossible with God? You only think it's impossible when he's asking you to do something. Let's face it, we're no different. We can analyze our abilities and what God wants us to do, but we often convince ourselves that we can't do what God is calling us to do. When Moses decided to step out in faith and use what God put in his hand, his life changed as well as the course of history. When God told Moses to throw that staff in his hand on the ground, something that was dead came alive. And I think it was more than just that dead staff. It might have been a little bit of dead faith in Moses' life. How many of you know we can all use a faith lift? And God never asks questions that he doesn't already know the answer to. He asked those questions for our benefit. God used what was in Moses' hand, and he used it for his glory and to change 
the world. Do you know that you could change the world? Do you know that through you, God can change the world? Okay, let's go, let's go that way. Remember that same staff that had turned into a snake in chapter 4 of Exodus turned into a snake again in chapter 7 when that miracle was done before Pharaoh. And then after that, Moses faithfully used that staff, that thing that was in his hand, to bring on the additional plagues against Egypt. And I'm not going to reiterate each of the individual plagues, but they culminated in the death of the firstborn child of all of the Egyptians. And through each and every one of them, God says, use that staff in your hand. But the most famous what's in your hand came after Pharaoh relented for a brief time and said, you may go. And the Egyptians began to follow the Israelites as they went. The Israelites came to the Red Sea, and they were between a rock and a hard place, literally, because the Egyptian army was behind them, and the Red Sea was in front of them. And God said to Moses, hold out your staff. Hold out that which is in your hand. And the sea parted. And over 600,000 Israelites passed through on dry land. And when the Egyptians began to pursue them, the water went over them. Archaeologists have found remnants of chariots, weaponry, and other things in about that spot. Science has proved that it certainly can be done, but we already knew that nothing was impossible with God. Throughout the next 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses continued to use what was in his hand. He continued to use that staff. As they followed a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night, Moses kept that staff with him. At one point, he used it to get water out of a rock. Another time to sweeten bitter water to call down manna from heaven, and when the Israelites were grumbling, to bring quail to them so that they had meat to eat. And those 13 miracles that he experienced were a direct result of Moses using what was in his hand. It was a simple stick. There was nothing magical about that staff. Every shepherd carried one. But once Moses surrendered that staff to God, it became the staff of God. Moses couldn't have done any of those miracles on his own, but when God empowered what Moses already had, by faith, Moses did mighty things for the Lord. When God empowered what Moses already had, by faith, he did mighty things for God's glory. Amen. What's in your hand? Not what's in your wallet. <laughs> what's in your hand? Secondly, we'll look at Samson. Remember Samson? He, he was a good-looking guy. Maybe too good-looking for his own good. And he got tied up with Delilah... Why, oh, why, Delilah? I don't know. But she discovered the source of his strength. It was his hair. God had set Samson apart for a particular purpose, to be a judge over Israel. He had given Samson superhuman strength, and God used him for many victories. But Samson rebelled against God. And as a result of his rebellion, he lost his strength. He rejected his own family. And he was hunted and hated by the Philistines, by the enemies 
who betrayed him, and he betrayed his people. He ignored God's call and followed his, his own way and lost everything. Now, have you ever ignored God's call? Have you ever done things your way and said, I'm doing it my way, God, not your way? Tell the truth. We all have done that. In this case, the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes and they imprisoned him after binding him. I would say that Samson was probably at his lowest point in his life. It took that for me to look to God, to come to my senses. How many of you have come to your senses when things were so bad you thought, there's no way out of this? It could be sickness, could be disease, could be loss, could be financial, whatever it may be. You think all hope is lost. And then you come to your senses. And you, so, you say, you know what? I have a father that loves me. And he will take care of me. Samson came to his senses. And he prayed, Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, give me strength for just one more task. It's found in Judges 16. And in Judges 15, 14, and 15, I'm going to read this to you from the NIRV. <clears throat> Yes, Lord? It says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. The ropes on his arms became like burned thread, that fragile, that they dropped off his hands. Picture that. These were strong flax ropes, but they appeared like just burned pieces of thread and fell right off of him. Is our God amazing or what? So Samson was free. He was free of his bonds. But there were 3,000 very well-trained armed men that he had to get through. With these odds, most of us would have told Samson to run for his life. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have a shield. There was no way humanly possible that he could survive those odds. But Samson grabbed something nearby, something within his reach, something that had been discarded. It was discarded by everyone else as useless. Do you know what it was? The jawbone of a donkey. What a weapon. Of course, there were only 3,000 guys and one mighty God. You might wonder, what could Samson possibly do with a jawbone? Well, the truth is he couldn't do anything. But God could take that insignificant instrument that was in his hand and use it to kill a 1,000 men. Who brought on that victory? Was it the jawbone? Was it Samson's willingness to let God use what was in his hand? No matter how insignificant the object seemed. No matter how insignificant you seem to yourself, you are of great importance to God. Because Jesus came to set you free to give you eternal life. God loves you. And he has a plan and a purpose for you. The devil is always telling us that what is in our hands is insignificant, whether it be our time or our talent or our treasure, whatever it is. And it truly is insignificant if we try to do things on our own. But that which seems to be insignificant to us, when we give it to God, he'll use what he's placed in our hands to bring a great spiritual victory. Praise God. Lastly, I want to look at David. 
There are many accounts of David's feats and his failures in the Bible. And I'm always amazed what God did through this most unlikely son of Jesse. The youngest, the, the littlest guy, the runt of the family, was chosen by God to do mighty things. And he did things far beyond his human ability. The one that stands out to me the most, obviously, was when Jesse, David's father, sent him to, well, take some sandwiches to his brother, or something along that line, to his brothers so that they may have something to eat as they were battling the Philistines. And all of the events that little David was going to encounter at that point would set him apart for the rest of his life. When David got to the camp of the army, there was a standoff between the Philistines and the Israels. If you could, if you could picture this, there was a great valley and a, and, and a mountains on each side. The Philistines on one side, the Israelite, Israelites on the other. And for 40 days, the champion of the Philistines, a fellow by the name of Goliath, who was 10 feet tall, whose armor weighed over 150 pounds. The tip of his spear was 15 pounds. That's as much weight as a bowling ball, folks. Stood before the army of the Israelites and every day for 40 days challenged them. He stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. He was taunting them, wasn't he? he is able to if he is able to fight with me, he said, and kill me, then the Philistines will be your servants. Oh, but if I prevail and against that person and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Looking at Goliath, you would not think that the odds were very good. I certainly wouldn't have wanted to face him. Goliath made that challenge for 40 days and no one took him up. Every soldier was scared to death of Goliath. It would be suicide for them to go up against him. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> then little David showed up. He heard what was going on and he yelled out, who is this Philistine that is defying the army of the living God? Have you ever heard somebody cursing Jesus? Using the Lord's name in vain? As my buddy Neil wrote, his name is more than just a swear word. It's the precious name of God. David was upset because this Philistine was defying the God of the Israelites, the creator of heaven and earth. His brothers told him to keep quiet. I don't know if you've ever read this or seen it. They told him to mind his own business. Who knows, they might have even said, you know, dad's going to be really mad at you. Get out of here, kid. That's when David ran over to King Saul and he said, Hey, King, listen, I keep my father's sheep, and when they're attacked by animals, I kill those animals. So I can take care of this ungodly Philistine that defies the armies of God. Listen to this. Evidently, everyone in the Israelite army was focused on Goliath. David was focused on on God. That makes the difference. No one else had volunteered, so Saul jumped at this opportunity. He was probably thinking, well, this kid's not going to last very long. But for, as a pretense, at least, he gave David his armor. Of course, it swamped his small body. He put his bronze helmet on David David said, I can't even walk. So he took it all off. 
it had to be a funny sight if you think about it. So here it comes in 1 Samuel 17, 40. It says, then David took his staff. He was a shepherd. Okay. Took his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in his shepherd's bag, which was just a little bag that he carried stuff in. He had his sling in his hand and he drew near Goliath. We, we probably all know the end of the story. When David walked out to meet Goliath, Goliath laughed at him and he said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And he cursed David by the Philistine gods. Then he said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David didn't flinch. He said to the giant, You've come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Then we know that David took one smooth stone and the giant toppled. We all face giants at some time in our life. And if we keep our eyes on that giant, we're going to be as successful as the Israelite army was. But if we keep our eyes on God and use what he has given us, even if it's just great faith, ultimately we are victorious. So what it's, what's in your hand? Remember, that question was asked to three ordinary men. And God enabled them to do extraordinary things after they obeyed him. Moses was told to use his staff, that staff that he carried almost all of his life. And God empowered him to perform hundreds of miracles with what he already had. Samson though he might have been a little too impressed with his own good looks and his strength and lost everything when he turned back to God, when he came to himself, when he realized he needed the strength of God, then God was able to use what was in David's hand or in Samson's hand to beat over a thousand well-trained men with just the jawbone of a donkey. And with David, one smooth stone and a sling toppled the giant. What's in your hand? God is still asking us today that question. He's asking us, what's in your hand? Do you ever wonder what God might use you for if you're open to him? Have you ever thought of using the gifts and abilities that God has given you? I've heard some beautiful singers in this congregation who would be afraid to stand up here and sing. But that's what God has given you. I know that some of you are good teachers and would do well. And I'd love to see our children's Sunday schools start again. Prior to COVID, we had four or five adults studies and we have studies for all the kids of every age what's in your hand what is it that you have that God can use to his glory and to build his kingdom and you know we're all about building the kingdom of God for the past 18 years I've been saying that it's not about building Glenvale Church of God it's about building the congregation or the, the kingdom of God and it doesn't have to be right here in this place, though I love to see your smiling faces. We're building a congregation worldwide on the internet. Some of us are going out and we're ministering in small groups. We're building the kingdom of God. Last week I met with three other men on the porch of my house for a Bible study. We're called to be disciples, aren't we? Who are you discipling? What's in your hand? My 
prayer is that you will offer by faith what God has given you back to God. No matter how simple it is, God will use it. He'll empower you supernaturally to do his work. And when you do that, you'll have a new sense of meaning, a new sense of purpose. And you'll realize just how rewarding it is when we follow him, when we're obedient to him, and when we allow him to use us. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what we're told in the book of Hebrews. He is what? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, who are open to him, who are obedient to him. And God has new and wonderful things in store for you if you will be obedient. It may take a little bit of prayer on your part, saying, you know what, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What ability or talent do I have that you can use for your glory? And I would ask you to begin to pray that way. Would anybody be willing to do that? A couple of you? I thought a little more rattling. Uh, never mind. <clears throat> That's my flesh speaking. God knows. He knows your heart. And when you're obedient to him, he will use what's in your hands. Let's pray. Lord, I recall a time when you saw a hungry crowd Thousands of people, and the only food were a couple of fish and bread, five loaves and two fish. And yet, when you took what was in that little guy's hands and broke it and offered it up as a sacrifice to the Heavenly Father, Everyone was fed, and there were 12 baskets left. Nothing is impossible with you. We just have to come to the point in our lives that we come to our senses and realize that it's time for us to stop being self-centered, stop saying, I like my ease, and say, you know what, I know Jesus is coming back soon. So Lord, I want you to use me. I pray that each and every person here today will ask God to use them, to use what is in their hand. And Father, if we begin to see that, we will really see the kingdom of God built. So we thank you, Father, for your patience with us. Thank you, Father, that you forgive us when we fail you if we confess our sins. But, Lord, empower us to do your will. We pray this by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, thanking you, Father, for who you are. We give you praise now in his name. Amen. Just a reminder that there is a benefit concert next Sunday night. For Brother Dusty Alleman. Dusty was left here and was on his way home to Oklahoma. The Okies out there. Look at my Oklahoma brother over there. And on the way out, the motor blew in his motor coach. And it is approximately $10,000 to repair. 8000 for the motor and 2000 for the labor. And yes, he does have some insurance money that he's gotten. And he's, he's able to continue to minister uh, just... It's a little more expensive to do that when you have to stay in motel rooms all the time. So some of his brothers right here in this area, Joe Tomlinson, who is a favorite here at Glenvale, we had him for our spring fling this year, and he will be at our fall festival of music next year. Randy Simpson, who is always a favorite, and Randy Penzinger, some of you may not know him, but he's a country gospel singer from the Shippensburg area. So we're going to have a good time here next Sunday. Please be prepared to give, to give sacrificially as we support our brother. These guys that are out on the road are our missionaries. When they come here and we give them an offering, that offering is sending them to the next mission field that they're going on to. 
So please bear that in mind and do come and invite some people so that we can fill this place next Sunday night. Amen. Just a reminder for tonight, uh, Focus Youth is having water night. So if you're between the ages of 10 and 18, chronological age, that is, <laughs> you can come in your swimming suit and have a good night as they do the slip and slide and all those things they do. And tonight I'll be here tonight doing chapter 6 of Hebrews, if you want to join me for a Bible study at 7. And uh, Barb, why don't we let you, oh, you already did that. Just a reminder that as Barb leaves with that light, it is a reminder to us that we are supposed to be the light of Jesus and we are to carry that light into all the world. Michael, you have a comment? Is, is it uh, unmuted? Hey, we need some mustard up there. We need some mustard up there. I like mustard. I like mustard I too. I don't know about you all, but... Uh, I had a, I like to, uh, I found YouTube and I like to, uh, I like to catch some things on there. And I, I caught a few things this week that, that I really wanted to share. If you get a chance and you uh, have YouTube, have internet access or whatever, and you can look up this song, um, it's called In Jesus' Name. And uh, my impression with this song is there's a lady sitting back here. I loved her husband. He brought, I think, I don't know, I, I think he brought us the idea of prayer into this, a stronger urgency of prayer into this uh, congregation. And that song touched my heart to the point where it's a, a song of her praying over a family, and it's with urgency and a fervent prayer. Um, and I'm asking, are we, are we praying like that? Are we falling on our knees before our God praying for our family and friends? Are we, are we praying for their peace? Are we praying for their salvation? Are we praying for revival in their lives, in, in the lives close to them? Are we falling on our knees crying to God that we need to see that revival in their lives, in our lives? And it just, it just really brought something to me that I thought, I, we need to pray like that. And I thank you. Pastor John, for bringing that realization to my life, that we need to have that fervent prayer, everything in our